Order of Light presents A new era of contact UFO sightings and strange anomalies Secret space programs and off-world adventures Advanced technologies and new discoveries Extraterrestrial abductions and contactees Now is the time to speak as we explore the unknown, the uncertain, and unseen, we are the Disclosure, and these are those stories. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the channel, all of you wonderful beings of light. Tonight, we have a very special guest, Laura Magdalene Eisenhower. It's going to be an amazing show, and tonight, I know most of you are probably familiar that Laura is the great-granddaughter of President Eisenhower. Pretty famous guy, pretty smart dude out there, did a lot of things, and also involved in the extraterrestrial community and all sorts of wacky conspiracies and ideas. But Laura knows it better than anyone else. With that being said, Laura has done a lot of things in her life. She's practiced, studied traveled all around the world and has such a remarkable background and I thought that it would be a great time and opportunity to get to know Laura a little better. When was her first experience that opened her eyes? When did she start to get into things? Her education, the things she has learned along the way up until what she's doing right at this moment. You know, on this show, we love to connect and get to know one another. And sometimes by going over our life journey, we get to figure out those small little puzzle pieces that we often overlook. And with that being said, everyone, make sure you hit that like button, give the video a big share and a thumbs up, and make sure that you subscribe to the channel. So, Laura Eisenhower, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. I'm doing great. Wow, Robert, it's great to be here. I interviewed you, what was it, like a year and a half ago about the UFO that landed it in was. your backyard. And wow. here I am on your show. What an incredible intro and intent. And wow, yeah, that's a big question. It's a wonderful question. You want me to just jump right into it? Yes. So, uh, you know, give us a little bit about, you know, your background for the people that are watching that by somehow, some way, they don't know who you are. Uh -huh. Just a little bit about yourself, et cetera. And then finally walk it into, you know, that first contact, that first uh, experience, that first eye-opening moment that you had. But yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself and who you are, where you came from and all that good stuff. Wow, Robert, thank you. Um it's always kind of surreal to have that be the focal point of an interview. Uh, yeah, where to begin? It, and you guys, if I turn the camera off, I'm still here. We just get weird weather. The bandwidth isn't sometimes good with the cameras. Oh, uh, wow. Well, I was born in London, England. Uh, my mom's Susan Eisenhower. I was born at home. She felt a calling to have this particular kid at home. Not to say she didn't want to have the other ones at home. I'm a middle child. My older sister's a year and a half older. And uh, I have a half sister, eight years younger. But she just felt, you know, I just have to have this kid at home. It wasn't like a thing back then. Like we hear about now, like used to be a thing and mostly is in different cultures and just the way we can all naturally do it, right? I think she knew like, oh, don't want to expose her to the hospitals and the possible jabs because I don't know, maybe it was just something she wanted to try out. I, you know, again, when it comes to my life, I'm still processing a lot of things, but not from the lens of, oh, I'm special. But I know I'm the loud mouth of the family and I am willing to dig real deep into my own soul journey and what really happened during Eisenhower's administration. So I was being visited uh, since I was a child by him. He had already transitioned, but we were talking a little bit before the show about Gettysburg Farm. Wait, and wait, wait, wait. But by your great grandfather, he was visiting you after he transitioned. Yeah, when I was a child. Wow. Yeah, and it wasn't like I was being visited by... How, how old, Laura? Let's see, we... Um, uh, five years old, my mom and my biological father got a divorce when I was four. We moved to a duplex in 
sort of a crappy part of Rochester, New York. And I just remember, and I'd be like, Caroline, Caroline, wake up. Are you seeing this? Because we shared a room, me and my older sister. And he first showed up sort of as a military man, you know, just to be like, okay, you know, look at the books on the bookshelf. This is me, your great grandfather. And I was like, what? And it's not like it was regular visits, but um, this was around the time that I had visited Gettysburg Farm while uh, Mimi, Mamie was on her deathbed by great grandma. And I remember me and my sister were holding her hand. We took a bunch of pictures. They were secret service guys. They had little pet names for us. Like it was like pumpkin pie, like, or something funny like that. But that was one of the, like right after she transitioned, which was a couple of months after we were sitting on her bedside, by her bedside, um, after she transitioned and died, they turned the Gettysburg farm into a museum. So every time I'd go back to Gettysburg, it's like, oh, now we have to walk through the house and everything's behind what, you know, the, the little barricade, like, what do you call it? Not a barricade, but you know, when you're at a museum looking at a house, yeah, it's a they give us class. like a special yeah. tour. Oh, the Eisenhowers are here. And yeah, they used to, you know, my mom was raised or partially raised there. The lady that took care of our family, Dolores Moni was the main uh, help uh, at the Gettysburg farm. She ended up going to the white house, uh, married to, her husband, who was a chef for presidents at the White House, even in uh, some movies they depict. Anyway, we we all wanted to write a book about Dolores, African American woman, uh, part of the family, and she spans generations. She helped take care of my mom. She helped take care of us when my mom got her second divorce and we moved from upstate New York. I was born in England, but we pretty much moved to upstate New York when I was about three or four years old, kept going back to England, moved back there when I was 12, not with my family, but to live with my grandma on my father's side, just to have that experience and be with my granny. It's a long story. Anyway, I was there for a little while. <laughs> I needed to like get the freak out of American school. So it was really cool. And it was like at a convent, not some elitist thing. There's no elitism, which I love about this family, even though they rub shoulders with those kind of people. And some have fallen into the not red pill realm I'm like, come on, what did Eisenhower warn us about? It's like, and I was telling you, you know, I'm kind of scary at the dinner tables. It's like, oh, don't give Laura champagne. Let's her at the kitty table because she talks too much. Um, just trying to get answers. Like I was recruited to go off planet. Hello. And like, what about Val Thor? And like, are you seeing this about Eisenhower? And it's sort of like, not like they were complicit, but it was like, let's focus on love. These are really big conversations because we got, you know, the younger generation here. But when I was a kid, it was all starting to spill out. But it was more like, let's divert Laura, go play badminton in the yard and go hang out with, you know, kind of like, oh. But my granddad, Ike said, and I were super close, but he had my back, but couldn't really have these conversations either. But he told me really funny stories and I maybe we'll share one. Um, but anyway, so after uh, having that, you know, final visit with Mamie. And we had a few, some, I was really young, you know, like infant young. So I don't fully remember. Um, I wasn't so much having visitation with Eisenhower. He was more saying, I'm with you. Now it's time for you to be on this journey and figure out what the heck happened in this administration. And the intuitive hit was there's a lot of disinformation. So since the age of eight, I've been on a quest, right? And it really accelerated during certain times in my life, especially Mars recruitment in 2006. But it started to hit me at the age of nine when I was at a grocery store with my mom and a weekly world news article, which is a joke newspaper like The Onion, said I remember. I with ETs, right? Or aliens. And I'm I like, remember that in the grocery store. Yes. It was and I'm up like there. nine years old, right? I'm like, whoa. I'm like, I know there's something to this. And that's when I really started to dig deep. I did have some visitations as far as contact with higher dimensional beings. And I was never really in my body. I was navigating the multidimensional. I had a really tar hard time being grounded because I realized I had to live a double life. I can't talk to anybody about this, even though they're related to him. It's too over their head or, you know, the kind of multidimensional perspective I had, even him visiting. It was like, okay, like I said, conversation would be changed. But my granddad really understood I was a black sheep of the family and that's Ike's son. And we had some profound experiences and I was, it was a uh, tradition of the Eisenhower women to be the debutante at the international ball, the main guest of honor. When it was my turn at 18, I had too many dreadlocks in my hair. I'm like, mom, this probably won't go well. And I don't want them to like cut it all off and like put hair extension. I'm like, maybe it's not going to work out. And, and it was the only time that an Eisenhower woman, when it was your turn, didn't show up. And I felt so bad. I'm like, man, I really probably let down the family. We went to John S.D. Eisenhower 
who is former ambassador to Belgium. He fought in the wars. He was written a bunch of books. Ike's son, John S.D. Eisenhower. He whispered to me at the table before they put me in the kitty table. And that usually wasn't his idea. My mom usually was. But he always wanted to hang with me, right? And he whispered to me, because I'm so glad you didn't do that social like bullshit and you didn't fall. <laughs> yeah. The man. I know. Right there. And what one quick question, Laura. I do want to ask you because you dropped a little. I'm still here. Yep. A few little tiny things in there that I'm sure everyone listening to. First thing I want to ask you, when your great grandfather was visiting you and he kind of told you, as you said, I'm with you. Is that in the sense that he is there or is that in the sense that he's within you genetically? Is that a part of you or is it a little bit of both? A little bit of both because, you know, obviously there's genetics. He's my great grandfather biologically. Um, But when he said with you, I think like um, I need to be by your side because you're going to be the family member that goes real deep, goes into the rabbit holes and sets the record straight about what happened in my administration, because you're going to run into a lot of the lies, the disinfo. It's not like I had that all figured out at the age of four or five years old when he visited and eight years old, nine years old when I saw the Weekly World newspaper at the grocery store. But I was like out of control downloads my whole life, right? Like I, I was like told I have ADD and all these learning disabilities. I'm like, no, I'm working. I'm freaking downloading. I'm looking out the window because I'm like downloading I, it wasn't wow. channeling either. It was just like, I, w- I just was being shown things um, coming from my own higher mind, trying to connect dots and not being in my body and doing a lot of kind of multidimensional work, which I got clarity about when I ended up at the Berkeley Psychic Institute. I got some clarity, but there, there's a lot of darkness in that place. Um, I was going to go to an herbal school in California. This is after I lived on the road with my boys who are twins with a very unstable man. So no, I didn't have trust funds or a cushy life. Some people think, oh, presidential bloodline. I bet you have trust funds. <laughs> no, no way. We all work really hard. We all have each other's back maybe to pay an electric bill. But no, it's not. You know, we, we've been a pretty tight-knit family. But it's a little bit weird now because of the planned scamdemic stuff. But that's not to really want to share. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, so. Um, and one quick right? question. I, yeah. I got to hop in there because you, you just. You briefly dropped something in there as you were going on, and you said Mars reincruitment. Recruitment. Like, in 2006, I was like, we talked about people being recruited to Montauk and uh, uh, yeah. talent camps. This was different. This was set up with a partner. I've shared about it quite a bit, but now those interviews are sort of lost, been censored. Um, and it, they use looking glass technologies to locate me and a partner in a past life. They had brought him in my lab, Tim. I haven't been in those projects or programs, but I was pre-targeted and what I've shared recently. And I know for some, it's going to be like a big stretch to believe it. And sometimes I'm like, are you serious? Somebody handed me a book years ago and I was searching for it. I'm like, I got to find this book. And I saved it under like Guardian of the Cell Worlds, which is the name of the book, has never been published. But before the recent Star Knowledge Conference, I'm like, I have to find it. I have to find it because it revealed that when he had contact with Val Thor, who helped him connect to the Guardians, the Guardians um, that he helped, basically star beings connected to the Nakota, Lakota, Dakota, Sioux Nation, if I'm saying that um, in the right order, um, had to like, like talk to him. And that they're connected to the guardians and migrations that happen in Lemuria, but also migrations of very advanced souls like yourself, star seeds, earth warriors, whatever you want to call it. In 1952, it says in this book, and I can show you the book, uh, uh, a a new migration happened that he helped to make sure happened because Truman wanted to shoot down these higher advanced star beings. And he said, they said, this Native American woman who gave me the, or the woman who gave me the book said the book was given to her that need to, and then she said, I found you. It needs to go to you now because they're talking about you. So it says in the book and I can share it that uh, Eisenhower was promised a future descendant that would bring about the truth when people are ready to hear it as a gift from the guardians, along with a huge migration of advanced souls that would all be working together. So I'm like, Holy shit. so that explains a lot about why they wanted to target me before birth, because one of the defectors of the Mars recruitment said, Eisenhower was briefed about your birth and that's why they went after you. Yep. And then I was agreeing about truth. You know, I'm a human like anybody else doing my best, but I've been willing to dig real deep 
And my family's done incredible. That's no criticism to them. But as we know, we get massively targeted and we barely survive some of it. So anyway, I hope that explains some things. But this is like recent. I mean, I'm still connecting dots. I'm still processing it, but it never ends. But at the same time, I don't just buy into anything or believe it. But when I see all the different dots that are connected, what was in that book and other things I've been handed without really seeking it out. I mean, see, I seek out truth, but not necessarily things that relate to me. I know I'm on a mission, but sometimes, you know, when it's like coming from something like that, I'm like, oh my God, there's no way. But I yeah. know like we come from, as you have had experiences, there's something we're connected to outside of being human that we're trying to wake up humans to because it's in their genetics, ET genetics, right? And some of these control groups that are negative alien agendas are trying to keep us from awakening that so that they can control humanity. When we can switch that on and tell them, hey, we're sovereign, you can't have us. And then they begin to back off, right? Yep, nothing they can do. And I mean, you, you nailed it. And that plays such a huge role. And when we have these situations and experiences happen to us, it takes a lifetime to understand. It's not a mastery. And sometimes these things are so outside of like you, anything we could comprehend. You like know? your story. Can you give us like, I mean, I know everybody who follows you knows this, but how do you process the UFO? And I know I interviewed you and I'm going to interview you again, but as an example, tell, can you just, I know, I don't mean to interview. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. No, a discussion. great example to kind of connect it with you. You know, I had ADD as a child. I was slightly dyslexic, slightly on the spectrum. They put me on some of the first trials of Ridlin because I sat there playing with my pencils. Uh, I was, uh, I'm native American. Drumming is in oh, my culture. Me too. I just bought a whole bunch of new drums and I, I'm getting drum up with the drummer from Sound Tribe Sector 9, which is a miracle. Oh, my God. We need to talk Oh, that's about awesome. That. Yeah. But that's but just like powerful believe, stuff. I can't believe he offers that on his website. So keep going. So you and, we were already into all yeah. that as a kid. And they and first trials of Ritalin. Targeting. And because there was a lot more. I was three and a half years old when the UFO crashed, the men in black and the gentleman wait, wait, from the Air Force. How old were you again when that happened? Three and a half years old. Oh, that's right. So I was just coming at the understanding of you know what was going on like i just had sherry divban talking about experience she had at a very young age i believe it was three years old uh that she had you know and that she... name you interviewed her yeah yep oh, cool. i gotta check it out so keep going yeah. right she'll be up uh actually well this is in the future but yeah the interview's already up at when this will be airing so, um, but yeah, she had an experience at three years old and she remembers a lot. And at that age, we're just starting to comprehend our reality. And that can be so hard to deal with that. And because of the UFO, UFO crash, the men in black and like the when Air we got Force, out of like training pants, we just got potty. No, that's yeah. probably like one and a half. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. keep going. Yeah. But you know, it put me on the radar to these groups and they were aware of what I was because my mom gave them the information after the hypnosis and regression after I she played such came a out. huge role in this whole thing i remember yeah so that you know when it comes to certain people being target targeted especially certain bloodlines and family groups that go back to king john etc roderick the great first king maybe of Wales. you can help me understand some of that at some yeah point. i, I actually have... talked so long about all this but so your mom like helped connect a lot of this right so you were she jump kid. started it and and your dad in the picture was remind me uh, i didn't know him and i met him for the first time when i was around i think nine years old yeah Did, so when he came back into the picture was it a benevolent thing or was he kind of like not oh no we're we're like really close but we just talked to each other it turns out it was a kind of a crazy situation. Like he didn't even know I existed for many years. How my mom got pregnant was kind of strange in itself. They didn't live in the same state. Uh, no one you get, really like knows. A, there was a bene uh, like some sort of intervention. World, kind of. Well, uh, manipulation. Well, I, I, I was asking my mom, like, you know, did you like uh, sleep with a Rasta alien? Because where did I get this hair? <laughs> yeah. Maybe my grandmother's side. I don't know. But did you, did you ever feel like 
you have an off planet father or just a different father than uh I do you feel, feel connected to your biological father that came back? I know because it's crazy because I met my dad and I was nine years old. And now that we're older, I just talked to him in the first time for a few years, like this week. And him and I were exactly alike. I don't know how. And my native side comes from him. My mother's family. Hey, rendezvous, maybe. Well, I think I located something else together on the astral or. That or something else took that and that and created one thing I know for sure from my mother, you know, I, I'm a, you know, politely test tube baby by gray extraterrestrials of sorts, whether they took my father's you genetics must be like and my mom need to heal the grays, right? Sorry. I, yeah. I, I, I don't know. No, I, um, I, the advanced races, um, so, this is, okay, I don't want to interrupt, but I'll tell you kind of my theory here, but keep going. Yes. Yeah, so from everything I could understand of it, you know, these beings would take my mom's embryos and eggs and stuff of that nature out. And I think they must have had something from my father, my earthly father stored in there. And these beings would always take it out, fiddle with things, put it back in my mother for incubation then pull it out at a later time yes. and grow it into a hybrid on their ship. Right, well, right, my mom right. was That's always right. asking them for one. And I think they did something. I don't know. I mean, it must have to do with the UFO that was in your yard. Is it part of like the family connected that? I mean, do you know Sarah Nablina and the extraordinary, the seeding that documentary I've interviewed her. She's a good friend of mine. Oh, no. That happened to her. Well, actually she's a like into women. She's never, she never had had, you know, intercourse with a man and she was impregnated and got pregnant. And her girlfriend was like, you're cheating on me. She's like, no, I was taking it up into a chip. And they did this to my eggs and they put it back into my body and I gave birth. So your mom had a legitimate, Whoa. Birth, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, me, me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so wherever it began, she delivered you. Right. So. Yeah, I have to so, check. So uh, some check of these green out. programs, some are a little bit nefarious, but the one you're talking about, which is obvious because of who you are, um, I feel. I, I do I mean I don't know. Uh, this is just what I'm kind of feeling into. You know, Bashar and the SS Auntie and some of those that are connecting with their higher self, kind of bringing it in. The Greys have some sort of thing that are a part of the healing journey that I think is also connected, not Eisenhower signing treaties with them, but being in an agreement to helping to heal the genetically engineered and modified humans that have suffered under chemtrails, GMOs, and all this crap that were originally advanced children that have created the breeding program to hybridize the advanced souls and star seeds with the greys so that the greys can actually genetically heal because they lost their soul matrix. So later in the timeline, which is connected to timeline one, timeline two, and Dan Burr stuff, and looking glass technology that wasn't able to see anything past 2012, that this was sort of a rescue mission to help the digressing um, grays, which some would say, not all grays are, that the digressing humans that are dealing with the pandemic and the jabs and this and that could potentially be engineered to be grays, that advanced souls have agreements to be abducted by them and have a breeding program to heal their genetics because they originally were advanced souls. The Orion Wars and some of those greys are connected with it and have somewhat been supportive, but some have felt enslaved by the reptilian agenda and still do operations that are against their will, but they've been so automated and cloned that they can't access their soul. And it sounds like you're helping them to heal. Does that resonate? I know everything you said has something to do with it. And not that I want to talk about me. This is all about you, Laura, but. You know, oh, my I mom, can't help my... myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. But, you know, my mom, these beings with the hybrid, she called them the tall whites, the tall gray extraterrestrials with white skin. They would use what she called little Zetas to help. And then she there are also had... Evelyn Zetas, sir. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, and she had other encounters, not necessarily with them, but other encounters with Dracos. I was going to ask, like, did she... Blue, light being, gray so, extraterrestrials, so Octorians, <sighs> Nordics. All of them? Mantis. She called them prey like mantises. All of them. So this is part of a greater alliance and collaboration. It was her, huge. whatever her genetics was, unfortunately made her like 
useful. Everyone had their own. Oh, that's pretty it was incredible. a t- tug of war. It was a tug of war. Holy and, wow, that's incredible. And, uh, so, um, then, others like Elizabeth parts. April that you hear about, um, other people that feel, you know, Elizabeth April and some of the other people talking about. Do you? I don't, I don't really. Or? I don't really listen. I think I heard of Elizabeth April once. Familiar with um, I I know a lot of people think I watch everything. I really people think that with me too. They're like, oh, you know who I'm. T-. I'm like, um, yeah. I can only I, stay focused. Like synchronicities lead me to things that I can watch. There's so many things that I haven't read and watched. I watch what YouTube, is put in front of but me. But it's like, yes, yeah. exactly. And just like yeah. the books handed to me, you know, I'll go out of my way to see certain things that come up on my feed or that I'll like, but but. Yeah, it's like people think, oh, you know, you saw the latest. I'm like, no, I, I'm, I'm like just dealing with downloads in my own mission. I check out what I can. A lot of it is to connect dots, and um, you know, with you, it's just like soul family, and it's like I'm always thrilled when you reach out. And I, and and now that I'm back on Face Whack uh, after losing three accounts, I'm like, yay! I was so thrilled to hear from you because your interview is huge, and that got a lot of hits too. That was great, wasn't it? <laughs> It, it it was very, very, uh, it saved me because eight days after doing the interview with you, I lost my Facebook account. So um, oh, no. after 15 years for no reason at all. I know, mine to, started in 2011, everything, everything. Oh, wow. Gone. Twice, and then I rebuilt it, lost it again. That's why I'm using I had the one name. page that had over 300,000 people. I had collected albums. I had, so yeah, I know your pain on that, brother. Yeah, and you people you lost in the past, and the last messages you got and then from they them. You, you unfriended know. them. They're like, "What did I do?" And I'm like, "Nothing." Did you yep. realize I lost my account? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yep, I I understand it, but that was uh, amazing. And uh, yeah, and it's been a journey. And go, going back to you because you're starting to interview me. But that helped I wanna, me rebuild I, I wanna... your channel. Oh, I'm sorry. I got interviewed earlier, and I'm like, "Who needs to talk about me?" Oh, but I'll answer any questions. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, but um, we'll definitely, I definitely want to come on and stuff. But <laughs> there's still so much I want to know about I'll, you. I want to ask so. you more questions still. Yeah. My apologies, everyone. <laughs> uh, it, it's okay. I, I'm having fun. It, it's amazing okay. <laughs> talk. I'm sure. I, I'm sure the people watching this. I don't really talk about myself too much, so oh, I'm good. sure that they're perfect because. They need they're to like, know. yeah, and there's a lot of things I don't, I don't say. I, know, I do a lot of with... interviews for people, and then sometimes when I talk about, it, they're like, I didn't know that about you, even though it's on my channel. I... <laughs> but um, so yeah, yeah go so ahead. I'll be quiet. Go- going back, let's go back to everything you were saying. We started going into the experiences of you know you going through and feeling this off-world connection. Certain programs, I think, we're leading into being like. Re- uh, you know, re- uh, recruitment into Mars. That wasn't my lab. I wasn't in like Monarch or MK Ultra. I I try and help yeah. and give a voice and and help understand. You know what all that is, right? Yeah. The SRA, the MK Ultra, and I might have been exposed to it in previous lifetimes, but not this lifetime. Yeah. Um, but my partner, um, he wasn't. I believe in a, a Illuminati bloodline. He spoke Gaelic. He was an Irish man. Oops, just said his name, but we <laughs> the cat's been out of the bag for a long time. I tried to protect his identity, and then he writes me and he's just like, Oh, you don't think people know who you're talking about? I'm like, I'm just trying to survive here. You know, you tried to drag me to Mars. Um, he was coming from a more well intentioned place. He joined the aviary. And what I realized before somebody d- did the research and put out a website about the aviary, which is a think tank connected to MJ12. They, uh, which I was picking up on when I was his partner, because basically everything I tried to create would continue to fail or there'd be some major attack or uh, people in my life that either were plants or they were major conduits to dark forces because they weren't very strong in who they were. So everything was always like, how am I going to survive this? You know, like a 25 year old mother of twins. My mom sold uh, a house that I was caretaking the land of. She didn't know I was pregnant with twins. The day she sold it was the day I told her I was pregnant with twins. And I was a caretaker. She had moved out of the D.C. area. And I was like, whoa, I'm completely on my own um, with this man who's not really stable. He meant well. He was having a lot of abduction experiences, actually. Um, And I wasn't having those, but I, 
uh, I mean, I, at this point I was just trying to take care of my baby. So I had two twins that people see pictures of not identical. And it was a miracle. They were 38 weeks, both over six pounds. Right. I was huge. People were like, are you giving birth to an elephant? I'm like, no, it's called twins. It's like, what? Like, I didn't even think anything would want to grow inside of me. I was being so targeted. I'm like, why can't I like create anything? This and that. So finally I'm like, after going to the Berkeley Psychic Institute, they helped me to understand like, all right, there's psychotronic weapons on you. You're being targeted. Don't take it personally. You know, because sometimes I was like, do I have really shitty karma? Did I do something evil in a past life? What the fudge? So I, I saved myself from an F-bump, even though we know the F-U word is very powerful. Um, so anyway, I end up going back home 2006. I am probably, let's see, if I had them in, um, wait, this is a book. Yeah, they were like six, seven, eight years old. It was like 2001. They're born okay. in, they were born in 98. This was about, no, no, no. Okay. By the time I met the Mars recruiter, that was 2005, 2006, right? So boys were born in 98. So eight, eight ish, nine ish. Um, so anyway, uh, I meet him at an event that I didn't know I was going to meet him at. I just, I was like, I can't just be isolated in my mother's basement now that I've moved home because I could not handle the control forces, even though in the, Berkeley Psychic Institute, they helped me to understand it. I'm like, I still, I can't create anything. So I'm going to follow where the control forces want me and I'm going to face them head on because obviously, you know, it's a little bit too strong and of a force because they're using psychotronic weapons, which they helped me to understand, which I felt since I was a kid. It's so, like a magnetic pool. Yeah. Like, and like you're a piece of metal. And, and, yeah. And, and they use plants. Like I had a roommate that was just a college kid. He tried to murder me. Yeah. What? Wow. I got so many stories, right? Um, anyway, so I end up in my mother's basement and I'm like, and there's a huge story before this story. And I hopefully if my book ever gets published, but it's like, but I don't like talking about me that much, but it connects to the larger picture of everybody, right? And the crazy paths we are on. Anyway, so I end up going to this little festival gathering, just camping where people are drumming, right? We both love drumming in Charlottesville, Virginia. And this man approaches me. He kind of looks like he's got the glasses and he kind of looks um, not like your typical hippie dude. He looks like kind of a, more of a professional. And it was more of that kind of gathering. But he sits down next to me, starts playing the drums and wants to connect and wants to hang out. And we talked all night, got real close. I went back to the basement under the house that my mom lived in, in Rockville, outside of D.C. There was a little downstairs basement where me and the boys were. Uh, and there was a kitchen and just an extra bed. And I just slept on the couch. Of course, I'm going to give my kids the bedroom. Right. And anyway, he's going to these secret meetings in DC and he's talking about this Mars thing. And I'm like, nah, I'm not going to Mars. That's not my mission. And then, you know, he kind of dropped the idea and I'm like, who in the hell is he talking to? What are these meetings? I thought it might be a public thing, like, you know, going to the moon and, and but I knew kind of that some of that was fake. But he kept referring to a handler who was Hal Putoff, who was a physicist in Austin, Texas. And I'm like, who is this guy? And who are these people that he's talking about? Other members of the aviary are John Alexander, connected to um, uh, Los Alamos. Um, and also, oh, you know, no, 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 you know no, that no, guy, no. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. This was the <laughs> recruiters, right? And then they were really pissed because they thought like they could use him as bait because they located us in a past life with looking glass technology. They're like, okay, we can't mind control or drag her into these projects, but we can drag the guy in, use him as bait and get her to go off planet. Right. And I, other people helped me to process this and understand it. Anyway, the whole idea was dropped when they realized that she doesn't want to go. So we end up having a Celtic hand fast little wedding. I moved to North Carolina with them. I think the whole idea is dropped. And it's not at all. And I had a very prophetic dream that helped me to break free from it. And when I told him, oh, I, I just got taken up into sh uh, a ship by chains. And this voice from the sky said, you need to make a choice right now. Are you going to go with them? Or are you going to stay here on earth? And I said, I'm going to stay on earth. I dropped down in the water. I can feel the cold of the water. And then I'm like, well, what about my partner? You know, who yo really was hoping that we, he would stay on earth with me. I, I try and fly up to back to the ship and there's lightning and thunder. And I woke up telling him this dream. I'm like, and you wouldn't come with me. You just went off on the ship because you shouldn't have told me that. I'm like, well, what? I'm like, I'm not going to Mars with you. I thought this idea yeah. was dropped or we were going to talk about staying on earth. He goes, they're going to take you anyway. They're going to kidnap you. Finally, I moved down the street. I'm like, this is freaking me out. I got young kids. I can't really deal with this. I, how did I end up like even, you know, marrying this guy, but they could pick up on our affinity. I thought it had all dropped the whole idea of, 
it being like a right away thing. Target date was 2012. He admitted to me when I met you at that, uh, that festival in Charlottesville, you were a mission. They gave me a code to come and recruit you into this. But mm. when he told me that he had to unplug all the computer batteries, the phone batteries, because he said they're tracking us and following everything. This is my only chance to tell you what's really going on. The minute he was done telling me all the batteries he put back, uh, he puts back in the devices. And when I brought up to him what he just told me, because I didn't say that, then he would get a phone call, disappear for days and not remember. And he was referring to a handler. So I knew he was under their control. And then I just had to get out of there and save me and my boys. Yeah. And when, when did you leave that situation? 2007. So we were only together okay. like a year. Um, okay. I moved to North Carolina in 2006 because the whole Mars thing got dropped and he kind of placated my whole, let's stay on earth together. Yo, I, I like, I, and then I started really researching these people. It took me two weeks and these folks are connected with the Paul Benowitz case and he kind of went nuts and they have a lot of sorted stuff. And I was looking at emails and different exchanges. And one of my really good friends was aligning with him and wanting to go to Mars. That ended up being a really shitty friend who destroyed my book. And she still has been messing with me since tried to get back into my life. Long story. I won't name names. Um, but yeah, it was about a year uh, after I moved to North Carolina. I moved down the street, became a landscaper, worked really hard. And a landscaper. I, oh. Oh, yeah. Well, my background's wilderness expedition leadership. But I love landscaping as a career, right, or a job. Because I was like doing grunt work, like a lot of labor, you know, cleaning hotel rooms, washing dishes, working at bakeries, um, just trying to take care of my boys. I was on food stamps for a lot of their life, lived on the road. But this was an opportunity to be sort of stable with this guy. And um, but yeah, then I was a landscaper. Him and I, it was like he knew to leave me alone, like that part of him that was still had a soul connection. Anyway, I got out of there. I had an invitation through a friend with a Swedish surfer. And we just went down to Baja, which is where I did a lot of my wilderness courses. And of course I wasn't a very experienced surfer. He throws me into these freaking unbelievable waves. And I'm like, holy shit. And I love extreme sports. Right. But of course, like the cord wraps around my neck. I'm like, I think I was born with a cord wrapped around my neck. I'm like, Oh great. I'm reliving my birth in the ocean in Baja. Like my favorite place in the world, almost a knockout of two that I think I haven't fixed it yet. And then I got a little bit better, but, and then he was a jerk to my kids. And I was like, see ya. Yeah. And, and then I was able to move to California in Ventura and they lost ability to mess with me because I was starting to expose them. They're like, oh, shoot, we can't mess with her. She's exposing our names. So Jack Sarfati and some of the others were like, Dan Smith, some, you guys can look at these names. They were like, can we do it like a, a show with you? So everybody knows that we're not the enemy. I'm not saying you're the enemy, but something's wrong with this agenda. And it connects back to alternative three in the Eisenhower administration under the Jason scholars. And when MJ 12 got set up under Truman, what I've discovered is there was an unconditional surrender agreement that happened in 52 under Truman. That was a surrender to the Nazis. But ever since Eisenhower has been blamed for the ET government treaties with the Draco and Grays. But if he had anything to do with the Grays, he was dealing with the positive Zetas. He was not willing to sell out the family. Believe me, Dan Smith, the senior advisor to the earth Alliance said, if, if Eisenhower had agreed to really sell out humanity, you guys would be sitting on so much wealth and so much advanced technology. And are you? And I go, no. He goes, see, how much more do I need to tell you, Laura? I'm like, I'm not telling you to convince me. I'm just making sure. And we've had a really interesting connection. <laughs> more to all that. I know I'm talking fast. I look kind of crazy today, but. No, no, that's, that's a lot of information. I'm sure everyone's going to. Uh, and what you're saying about Truman because uh, the Granite Treaty with Eisenhower and all that, that was uh, 1954. And you yes, were saying renewed that every 10 years. So they used him as a scapegoat. They had already signed away after and the Truman boat boat flew over in 52. Um, that's around the time the unconditional surrender agreement happened. Right after the Admiral Byrd mission to Antarctica failed around 47, right? Yeah. So the Granite Treaty was a front in a lot of ways. It almost like how there's the private space program and then the NASA public. The one treaty want, was the happy public and the other one was way before. Was, right. This is in the disclosure community of disinfo agents. And Richard Doty, who's one of the biggest disinfo agents, was a member of the aviary, the Mars recruiters, right? Mm -hmm. So some they targeted, like my former partner, were well-intentioned. They were groomed to feel like they were being heroes. So they didn't enjoy the fact that I was like, battling really hard for the truth to come out. I'm like, these are lies. I can just feel it. 
you know? Um, and, and sometimes I would be like, what if I'm wrong? You know, I'm, I don't have a big ego connected to my intuition. You know, I've been told I have dyslexia and learning disabilities. So why would I be like, oh, I got this all right. But when you're a mother, especially, and when you're just a soul centered person like yourself, you're going to stop at nothing to protect your children and protect the truth. And that's what I was able to do. And here that, we are. <laughs> and that's why I admire about your story. And I was going to bring up because you had twins and I come from a family of twins, but my family's story, my mother ultimately sacrificed, you know, her life essentially, you know, the way she lived her life and all of that. And uh, sacrificed talking about her experiences in order to protect our family to protect me from being ridiculed be oh by being God. made fun of all Is of that alive? are you still in contact uh she passed away in 2020 uh oh about God. two months before i found the ufo crash articles and evidence proving our family's claim and that's why i did everything i did I for my mom and now. yeah oh my God. Yeah, so she really, you know, just kept all of that stuff in. And because she didn't want me to have, that is you know, huge. also and, and the, the men in black threatened her that she didn't oh my report God, and you it were as a UFO. That at three. They came to your door, you said. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, and my they, God. I, I got to listen to the interview again. I can't wait to. Yeah. <laughs> so your dad, though, is still alive and you guys are still in touch, right? Uh, Yes, yes. And uh, I just got a hold of him and um, I'm looking forward to catching up. But then we, we talk how every you process what you're doing and everything about your past and stuff. Well, he, he's familiar. My mom's told him about her abductions. All my mom's boyfriends or husbands throughout the years uh, have been aware of my mom's Did story. Did any of them feel like plants or was she able to connect with ones that didn't want to mess with her? No, I don't. I don't think her boyfriends were. It was more plant. tug of war with the with the ETs, right? <laughs> yeah. No, honestly, um, her last husband, who is, uh, you know, my I call him pops. You know, he's a great guy, and he would be in there in the room, and the light, the room, there would be a light that would just burst the whole room, and my mom would just be gone out of bed, completely missing for a few hours. And um, that sounds like yeah. she was with like men that really like cared about her, and it was just yeah, she did that right? And, and my mom had a rule: she would never be with a guy that would ever be like uh harmful or bad towards I me. I was with good men that weren't strong enough to handle being targeted. To target me, like Doctor. Let me um cover up his name, Doctor Dreary. Oops, that probably gave it away too much. We were public people together. Very benevolent person, right? turned so dark when he was with me absolutely like pretty much destroyed i i never really get that sick i was in the hospital very sick he just comes takes a selfie and he's traveling doing all this healing stuff on everybody none for me but is taking pictures like convincing the public oh he really loves me um and then he had a double stroke and on his deathbed he said i realized you know what i put you through and sent me some money to make up for all the bills i was paying and i was used to being a single mom and having to work real hard bless his heart i forgive him i'm not saying this to smear him but that's how powerful the targeting was it wasn't just plants what was exposed about the mars recruitment is they had a list of men that they would target and put in my path which were ones that usually can take no for an answer not in a rapey kind of way but in a oh yeah sacred union and i'll take care of your kids well first off nobody needs to take care of me or my kids but you know twins is really intense right and it's like huh and that wasn't why I fell for them because I needed, you know, to love a person. I'm not looking to be rescued. And I appreciated who they were. And there was affinity and chemistry. And and this has happened numerous times. Well, maybe after the Mars recruiter, after their dad, who didn't end up staying in the physical plane with us, um, there were about two of the sweetest surfer and then Dr. How about we call him Mr. Who instead of Dr. That, that's a good one. Mr. Who remember doctor <laughs> yeah all right well anyway um i i want to be quiet now that i've spilled the beans too much your turn <laughs> uh yeah so um but you brought up a good point you were saying that you know the the attacks on you even if you were strong enough to have this up the people that were around you would also that be convinced me i needed them friends you know oh i'll be your assistant 
and go to events with me and then completely sabotage me or keep me up all night asking for readings, which is fine. Oh. I'm not holding that as a judgment, but it's like, I have to do a read. I have to do a presentation tomorrow. Like, and you're not being an assistant. You're driving me around thinking I need that, but I'm like at an Airbnb that I paid for, not you, where I have rides and Ubers. Like I've been doing this for a long time. Like the, the woman that destroyed my book swooped in because she wanted me to do relationship kind of like, oh, I've missed you. And oh, are you still mad at me for destroying your book? And I'm like, well, you right. never really apologized. And you're, and, I, and it was like, I can't believe I gave this person another chance because right after I did give her another chance, I ended up in the San Mateo jail in a blood soaked prison cell being abused after being drugged and followed after Mount Shasta last year. No, I, I saw that post. When all that happened, I, I remember reading all of that. And yeah, wondering... sorry, you, you're cutting out. That's why I turned my camera off. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, I remember. I'm the over whole it. Thing. Yeah, but that was like, fuck, messed up. <laughs> yeah, that that was wild. And from my angle of just being a guy on the internet and seeing the pictures of you all bruised and beaten and and the story behind it of the whole entire story, that was really See? really. And I'm like, suspicious. why did they give me a doctor? I'm like. I was pulled out of my hotel at 11 a.m. I'm just getting a layover, right? I do New Living Expo all the time in San Mateo. And I said to the cops, it's funny. I'm like, I'm on a poster over there because I, I, I'm speaking in a couple months at this expo. This was a layover, though, from the Shasta area to San Mateo Airport or San Francisco. Or, and I had a hotel in San Mateo because I, uh, the plane got delayed and, and everything got messed up. So I had to get a hotel. This wasn't during a time I was a speaker at New Living Expo, but nobody was listening to me. No medical care. I'm just yelling like I usually do when I'm put in jail. And they're usually like, get her out of here because she's red pilling everybody and she's screaming and the, the <laughs> prisoners are cheering her on. This time, though, um, I wasn't uh, I couldn't hear other prisoners or people in jail. There was one cop that had my back. He's like, oh, my God, I can't believe how they're treating you. I'm going to get you out of here. And he did. I'll tell you what, whoever was in that jail cell with you, Laura, oh, they have no idea how lucky they must, they, they must have had the time of their life with you. In there. Well, these are other jail experiences and some of them, nobody, I was just in the holding tank, right? But I would be yelling loud enough for all the other uh, people in jail to overhear me. They'd be like, you tell them, sister. And then one of the guys calls my husband, you got to get her out of here, right? Hey, that's the that idea. Drive, though, drive them like nuts 2017. until they get rid of you. If you drive them crazy enough, they'll they'll let you go. Right, right. Um, and uh, yeah, what are you gonna do? Like, put me in like you know solitary confinement because I'm calling out the new world order and how complicit you are and how you're probably showing up the satanic ritual abuses you. And I'm like, and look how it's all set up. And then I'll call it all out. And they literally like when Kevin still laughs about it to this day. Because when I picked you up from there, they were shaking. <laughs> But that's different than imagine. the San Mateo one. That was like back in 2017. That's a completely different story. I wasn't drunk driving or anything. I was just parked and camped. And this was when I was still drinking. But I knew not to drive. But my keys were close enough to the ignition. And I was playing music too loud. Yeah. And I was really stressed and just having a little bit of a panic attack. Because I was being stalked by this person who was trying to... Long story. We don't have to go there. Yeah. But I, I know a fun story about... My mom, for example, one night she went out to a bar. She had too much to drink. So she got in her car and she said, I'm not driving. I had too much to drink. She threw the keys in the center console. She locked the doors and she went to sleep. And then guess what? In the morning, cops are knocking on there and give her a DUI. She's like, I wasn't That's what driving. happened to me. I to avoid jail time, I rehab for a month. Four people from the rehab actually died, and but I made really good friends. They allowed me to bring my tarot cards and not my etch a sketch. But keep going with your mom. So yeah. she same, same slept situation. there, and they came the next morning. Uh, yeah, it was early. It was it was around like four. Figure she passed out around two. She was only asleep okay, for maybe two and, and a half hours. Parking lots. I get that they monitor parking lots, but you don't throw somebody like that in jail for this. For I'm for like, doing what they're supposed to. Like. It, it's better to sleep in your cars with your doors locked and doing no the right thing robs you and you get in sh so sh it's, that's what uh, happened to me yeah wow. um same thing so that's why i know that you're telling the truth because i i've seen it firsthand but it's all control one point of the vehicle or something like 
Oh, well, there might have been an intent because your keys are what? Like, like right. pluck the well, ruler, asswipe. Yeah, like you're not going to leave your keys on I'm like, the outside of the car. I have a sleeping bag in the back, okay? That's why Just because so I was trying to find a better song doesn't mean I was going to drive because somebody called them and said, and I was parked, you know, uh, in, near Polson, Montana. There was a party going on. People were walking past me. They're like, oh, because it was a private party. We don't know who this woman is. She's playing music. I thought it, it was close enough of a pull off. It wasn't in the neighborhood, but people were parking near me, walk, walking past me. And um, I just thought it was a pull off because it was a scenic, you know, because everywhere in Montana is beautiful, right? I was just having a kind of a meltdown day and I, of course, wasn't going to drive. The keys were nowhere near it, but I'm like, but it was close enough for them to call it a DUI. And then my yeah. husband, like, you know, he's like, please just let me pick my wife up. And the EMT who had come, they're like, I'm sorry, it's too late. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Anyway, fun times. But yeah, anyway, any thoughts? Um, we, we don't have to go there. I know I'm probably running wild with some of these tangents. But... Oh, but uh, a few things I wanted just to bring it back, back in the middle. So, uh, you know, when you were around five years old, etc., and this goes back to your children, your twins, etc. When you were five, you were seeing your great grandfather, you know, higher dimensional being and communicating with you and kind of allowing you to know what your mission's going to be. You know, I'm with you, carry on the torch, you know, shed light on what's really going on here. My question to you, Laura, have you ever seen any uh, signs of interactions coming from other family members and or your own children? Is this something where you're just a one-off scenario or have you had other family members that go through this as well? They don't talk about it. I mean, I've planted the seeds. I brought it up at numerous gatherings, family reunions. We Nothing. Went to, we went to my granddad, Ike's son's house every year for Thanksgiving. We had multiple family reunions. We show up for each other's weddings and this and that. You know, sometimes we always can't make, especially to the new ones, now that the pandemic stuff has come about. Um <laughs> Some have not seen through that. If you know what I mean, I'll leave it at that. But um, Andrew Bashago thinks that my Aunt Mary has something to do with Mars. Uh, and, and I brought it up to her one night. But of course, that's when I you know, was lucky I could get a word out. And we were at a big gathering. They kept refilling, not my family, but the waiters. Because we were at a public function for this one. Even when I was at the White, ha uh, White House. Uh, for the bicentennial dinner of Eisenhower. I was 16 years old and they were pouring champagne into my drink. It wasn't my family. They're like, and so when I met Bush Sr. and I shook his head, I go, it's showdown time. And then my mom's like, oh. <laughs> I got so many stories. So anyway, it was a gathering where somebody's like, okay with me drinking, right? And then I'm like, Aunt Mary, let's talk about Mars. This is before Andrew Bashargo. I, I think I said it to everybody in the family. Cause I didn't know the connection with Mary. The last thing I remember is, uh, I woke up in the hotel room. Um, and after smoking in the back with aunt, Anne and aunt Mary, you know, kind of laughing about other stuff, knowing that they really always have tried to change the subject. I don't know who's hiding what, if they're afraid for their life, if Eisenhower and Mamie said, okay, we can't talk about this because this is the generation that could be offed maybe with intuitive awareness or Eisenhower knowing and being brief that a future child would be born that could expose this truth. For some reason it was handed to me, right? Not my siblings or cousins that are more my age. Right. So I recently wrote aunt <laughs> or married and I think I freaked them out. And this was like two weeks ago. Right. Oh, wow. Cause I sent them like all sorts of stuff about grays, about Eisenhower, about, um, how he didn't sign the treaties and this is what really happened. And they didn't return the message after they returned the first message saying, Oh, we love you. And yeah, maybe we'll drive out to Gettysburg next time you're, but they haven't written me back after the first initial message. And then I like, then I just shared one of the karaoke videos from family reunion where <laughs> is, and me and others are, are singing karaoke just to be like, ha ha. Remember the good times. I still haven't heard back from them. 
Oh, it's wow. Post this because I probably shouldn't be saying all this publicly. Editing, it's not like so. it's going to get back to them. They don't watch this stuff. But I, I'm not saying that they're ignoring me. I'm not saying that they're not in the know or didn't have experiences. The thing is, I don't know. Nobody talks to me about this stuff. No one has. I told them I feel up. really alone in this. Like, why is this all dumped on me? Where's everybody? And we have fun as a family, but like nobody wants to talk about this stuff. Have you not seen the numerous books and articles and and stuff about our, you know, your grandfather, my great grandfather? So I mean, if it, we'll if see it what happens, just to be updated. A little example of this after the UFO crash, you know, my mom, my aunt next door, everyone being very aware of what happened. And my grandma wasn't there at the time of the crash, but she came later on that night because it was her house. She was off at work and she came back. And, you know, a lot of people talked about this for weeks to come. My mom was kind of like you, Laura. She just couldn't shut up about it. She was so blown away. And she's like, what? And it, throughout the years, the more my mom would bring it up, I remember my grandma just like, anytime we would start talking about it, she would just stand up and walk away. Oh or my, my aunt gosh. would just become really silent and just a lot of deflection, even though they knew it was absolutely real. It's just, I think sometimes these things are just too much for people to think about. It's, it, you know, growth is uncomfortable. It, you, yes. And what I also got, it's too much when it's a family gathering. We're trying to just, you know, future generations, even though they put me at the kitty table, we're talking about the younger cousins or the people that are my nieces and nephews. I'm like an overgrown woman, like at the kitty table. It's like, oh, I bet they think, you know, because I'm really good with kids, which is a lot better than sitting at the table being like, hey, guys, what's going on with 9-11 and me being recruited <laughs> hard? You know, it's like... You know, how did we divert her attention? Um, so, yeah, that was pretty much all throughout my life. But there was still a lot of love. But it was like, I respected the fact that some of this is too much. Let's talk about it outside of the family gatherings. I totally got that. Nobody answers my messages. And I'm still emailing to this day. Probably haven't emailed to anybody in years. I just reached out. Maybe they're still processing it. Yeah. I don't and, know. It's uh, like, I mean, didn't I plant enough seeds with some of the things I spilled? So I think, oh, shoot, I shouldn't say his name. Anyway, he always brings a karaoke machine. The way we all like just end up bonding and having a great time is, and, and I can't believe I did karaoke of Led Zeppelin in front of the Eisenhower family and all sorts of, we have so much awesome. fun. I know. And, and and you can see him in the videos going, yeah. And even like my Aunt Anne's like crying. She recently passed away. My mom's laughing mm. and we have so much fun. But I think it's so much. And they give me sort of a respect from afar. They're like, we don't, we can't go there. We see that you are, we love you, but we just can't talk to you about this. And I'm like telepathing with them. I feel like, okay. Which your mom might've felt with like the grandma. You're talking about her mom, right? Yeah. Yeah. And same kind of thing. It, it was what the about same. You when you went to the family gatherings. Uh, my mom and I went, when I was young, I was really into it. But after a while, you learn there's a time and a place to bring these things I up. I know. That's why, yeah, nobody allows me to have any champagne or wine at these gatherings. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops, I didn't mean and, to. Uh, but I, but I never stopped. And once I found 30 years went by and about, you know, two and a half, three years ago, I forget how long ago, I found the evidence. And once I found the actual articles and the physical proof and evidence, then everyone in the family started talking about it again. It's almost like uh, well, that's there's huge. This, it couldn't be in know. denial, but gosh. And I see, I sent them things that should be enough evidence. I think maybe they're still processing. Maybe there's some hope. So what was that breakthrough? Like we had a gathering. Did, did you just send it through email or? Well, no, my grandmother lives right next door. And when I found the articles, you know, like I said, it was two months after my mother passed away. I ran next door. And I'm like, oh, my oh gosh, I call that was like uh, 2020. That was only three years ago. Two years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not long. And I ran next door to my grandma. I'm like, look, look, look. I, I, I knew it. I knew I would find it someday. And then one day. And she knows my, on a spiritual level after her daughter passed, she has to look. Sorry, keep going. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, my grandma actually felt a little bad 
all the time she kind of did just blow it off you know and she didn't want to listen to it because now she's been hearing about it on the news and all this you know what i mean and she's realizing now after finding the articles then she had her twin sister my grandmom's the twin and she had her twin sister and her other sister which was the aunt that saw the ufo first and called my mom next door she came over and until that day my grandmother never heard the aunt that saw the original ufo she never like they never had a conversation about it and i said she had to be the one to hold the sanity and the grounding like it might have blown her too much open that she's like exactly one here i can't go there but the day will come where I will because she's stayed loving, right? She's still been yeah. grandma, right? And and my Aunt Booty, the one that actually saw the UFO first and called my mom, she's a very big religious woman, goes to church, highly you know, involved with all that. And to my grandmother, she really like praises her as like the perfect, sweetest woman ever. And when I wow. showed my Aunt Booty the articles and my Aunt Booty started to recount the story, the same story I've shared with you, my grandma's face, the hear it, it was almost like if the Pope told you, aliens and UFOs are, you know. Oh, right, like, right. But that, wait, what, what, what happened to your grandma's twin, though? She, no, no, she was there as well. She was okay. hearing all of this and they were hanging out. They kind of live she on She was much more Eva. privy, right? It took a while for your grandma. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And, um, it was just amazing. And then my uncle started hitting me up and, oh, I remember your mom talking to me when that happened and the men in black coming out and threatening her. And then oh I started my to God, have... Oh my God, you finally got the family to really like even recall those yeah. memories after all this time, after 2000. Not just the family, her friends started messaging me Jeez. from back then. That were like there that at just, the crash it, it was site. a domino effect kind of deal. People on the fire squad, people on the EMS respond. Fire, yes. I have so much evidence. It's the Roswell of New Jersey that I no one wants to hear me. about. Nuts. So I might yeah. be on a new series, and anyway, whatever. Like God, they'd be like flipping out. They probably. I'm gonna send your channel and everything about you. It's like yeah. have, no, but have, have bigger networks like Discovery or History Channel contacted you yet? Okay, well, I've been on like Ancient Aliens, Unexplained with William Shatner, and they're trying to do a series with me. And uh, do you mind if I share your channel and everything about you? Oh, please. Uh, they're going to be like, what? And uh, I have a playlist going over, you know, just the the story and all that with all the evidence and all that. Oh, good they stuff, are but... going to flip out. And it's like, yeah, you're you're like one of those, like, you haven't heard this yet? kind of people <laughs> yeah and your interview that i did with you on your channel was up there with like literally one of the best because we really got into it and i i went over so much in there so uh, that was solid that was a yeah and fun it's one. Cool being featured it didn't get taken down it got over like one hundred twenty thousand hits yeah that wild it was a lot of intel and you dropped some knowledge too in there <laughs> no it's awesome. all good but um if you could, I know you got a lot of big things in the works, a lot of different projects and people you're working with. If you want to just, you know, let everyone know what you're up to and up and coming uh, projects awesome. and all that. Because tonight was supposed to be all about you, but you're oh, such gosh, an no, amazing person. Uh, no, you, I shared you, plenty. You put it all on me. No, the dots connect, though. I shared so much about me. And I mean, look at how what similarity there is and how much the dots connect. It would be very, very... Oh, I wouldn't want to hear it if it didn't include you as much. So don't mind me if I ask you a bunch of questions. It's like, it, I this is one of my favorite conversations. So thank you so much. Um, Cosmicguy.org. I keep everything updated. There's a few things I haven't added yet, but Conscious Life Expo happening uh, in February. All those dates are there. There's a cruise. Um, and yeah, I'm a oh, the cruise. cruise ships. I have yeah. a for, I have a friend that will be one of the speakers on that cruise. Can you come on the cruise? Well, I, you should prob- be a speaker. Pro- probably not. I, I don't know. But um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell her, like, you should have him. Um, You know, cruise ships are a little weird. And the coastline of, you know, California, Mexico is being a little bit targeted. But I bet, you know, those of us that will be there will help anchor the energy. You know, Sandra Rose, who's connected to Scalar Technologies, Jason Shurka, Jimmy Church. 
And some that I might just be like, I don't really want to talk to you, not out of judgment, but out of like, uh, and I won't name who those people are, but you know, that's kind of life, right? We don't need to run away from doing all we can to stick together as a community. And when there is that need to have a boundary, there also will be an opening probably to have a breakthrough and a healing transformative conversation. Um, and I always hold that for those that there have been misunderstandings with and those that have actually hurt me. Um, that's what I'm working on anyway. And uh, let's see what else. I hope my book will get published soon. It's been really quite impossible, but Brad Olson, he's going to be on the cruise ship too. He's my publisher and uh, we got some things to talk about and he's great. Of course, always. And uh, let's see what else do I have going on? I usually mostly am able to keep my website updated. I do all my own tech stuff. The best way to really have one-on-one -on -one, uh, is my subscription. And I have a podcast. I now have a secondary podcast. I do newsletters, Zoom events, and discounted Astro sessions. And a telegram. And a telegram. Yeah. And that's most all on my channel. And I got a bit shoot. And I'm trying to build those alternative channels. Yeah. So I'll Thank have you, uh, I'll have those links in the description, everyone. Make sure if you haven't checked her out. I know we were talking a lot about, you know, just that's the thing, Laura and I, we just talk and stuff, but uh it was a lot of fun and thank you so like much. Just being with such a good friend and soul brother, and uh yeah, and I think it just makes for just something even more special and better than just me. I mean, my yeah. God, thank you for allowing me to, I can't wait to just interview you and, and all that, um, will happen synchronistically with us and, and those that we know and love in the future. And I would like to do a round table with you and Charnel and we'll talk about that. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Love yep. you. Ha have a good night. You See too. you all next time. Bye. Bye. merchandise store we got a lot of different t-shirts there the humans aren't real lower always creek incident we got tank tops and merkaba we got stickers glasses a lot of different glasses so get thirsty we got bags i live in new jersey we don't have bags anymore so it's really nice we got flip-flops hoodies and all the ladies out there we got a bunch of awesome merchandise for you please join the youtube membership for my channel you will get exclusive badges really awesome emojis member only live live streams, posts, and chats, and connections with me for only $5.99 a month. See you there.